By training, I'm an atmospheric scientist. But deep down in my soul, I'm a Formula One driver. Every single on-off ramp on Interstate 74 is my Grand Prix race. And I'll just be honest, I am a gearhead. I love cars so very much. That's what I think about all the time. It's interesting though, um, I have a bad habit that comes along with my cars and that is I tend to buy another one every single year. I buy and I fix and I sell. But in summer of 2010, I decided to do something a little bit different. I had a car that I liked and I didn't want to sell it. Now missing an entire summer of wrenching away in my garage meant that I needed to find something else to give my attention to. So I decided to build a wind turbine. I actually don't know why, but I built a little one. It's about this big. And uh, I built it in my garage. It was good if the winds were above about 35 miles an hour, but it made power. My goal was to take that to an Illini football game. If I could power my, ta my tailgate, uh, that would be a pretty cool thing. Uh, so what was interesting was that news got out that I was building wind turbines in my garage. And lo and behold, the university asked me to teach a class on renewable alternative energy, something I've never taken a class in myself. But I said, yeah, yeah, let's do this. And, uh, and things, things began to change for me. Uh, so when I started to think about putting that class together, I thought about two things. I had studied the Earth's climate extensively. I knew there was a very intimate relationship between energy and climate change. And I also knew about this. When you look around this planet, you will see that there's a huge disparity in the way that power and energy is distributed. And these two things kind of serve as a motivation as I built this class and spent the last few years really trying to understand different sources of energy. So let's start here. What we're looking at is a graphic that shows you how energy has transitioned in the United States going back quite some time. As you look at this graph, you'll see that we used to get all of our power, that being the y-axis, all of our power from wood. With time, we continue to transition to more energy-dense materials, so from wood to coal, from coal to oil, from oil to natural gas. And these three substances right now make up the majority of the energy that we use in the United States. They are fossil fuels, though, and therefore are finite. And I've been very curious about how this is going to transition into the future. Where are we going to be getting the energy that we use? And we use a lot of it. Just to kind of give you some perspective, I decided to do this. Let's figure out how much energy a community like Champaign-Urbana uses with each of those different energy sources you just saw. So let's start with wood. It's got a certain energy density. Uh, it's 18 megajoules per kilogram. Well, what does that mean? Well, have you ever seen a picture of this tree before? This tree that we're looking at right here is General Sherman. It's the largest giant sequoia on the planet. If you'd like to power Champaign-Urbana by extracting the energy from a tree like this, you'd need around 1,000 of them. Let's keep thinking here. What about coal? A little bit more energy dense, 32 megajoules per kilogram. Well, how many rail cars full of coal would we need? It turns out that you need something close to 10,000 rail cars full of coal just to keep the people in Champaign-Urbana with the power we're used to having. Let's keep going. What about oil? Oil, 46 uh, megajoules per kilogram. How many barrels of oil would we need? It turns out you need something around 5.7 million barrels to keep this going. Finally, on my list, I had natural gas, even more dense. I'm going to put it in a smaller container, though, because I have one of these on my back deck. And I want to know how many of those I'd have to fill with propane, well, with natural gas, to power Champaign-Urbana. The number's staggering. It's 73 million. So I started to think about these things and remember that they're finite. But we're kind of going on a path here to more and more energy-dense materials. And I knew that living in Illinois, about 50% of the power that we consume doesn't come from these. It instead comes from nuclear power. And you can see the energy density here is su su substantially different, 86 million megajoules per kilogram. So how much is that? Well, it turns out you need uh, about one 800-pound uh, gorilla. But it turns out gorillas don't weigh 800 pounds, so you actually need two real gorillas to make that amount of energy. But you can clearly see it's in a much smaller container. So after kind of seeing this perspective, I wanted to go back to this idea here of how much energy does the United States use. So let's keep a focus here on the US. Let's go from Champaign-Urbana up to the US. What we've got is an energy flow chart, basically what comes in and what goes out, what we need and what we consume. And when I saw this, I wanted to kind of make an outline of it so that we could kind of better understand what I want to do for the rest of this talk. 
If you notice in the previous slide, only two tiny little slivers of the energy that we need come from renewable or alternative sources. And I want to see if we can play a little game. And that game is, can we provide what we ultimately will consume by scaling up what we currently have outside of fossil fuels? Now, in my game, there are rules. We must use proven technology. All right, so no cold fusion today. Uh, secondly, must be scalable. Uh, where we do a lot of our hydroelectricity uh, generation in this country is also in a massive drought. So we're going to ignore hydropower right now. And the last thing we have to do is we're not going to make any outrageous assumptions. Not, well, let's cover the entire planet uh, with solar panels and then we'll take care of everything. So I started to think about this and this is what we're going to do. First, how much energy do we actually use in the United States? The numbers are ridiculous. 100 quadrillion BTUs, that's 29 trillion kilowatt hours. Most of us can't even put these numbers into context, and that's fine. But I do believe that most of you can put it in the context of this. Each individual is 100,000 uh, uh, kilowatt hours, and we might understand the kilowatt hour more if we think about a microwave. So if you'd like to know what the average US citizen consumes in terms of power, that is each of us, all 318 million of us, have 10 microwaves, and we run them for 525,600 minutes each. That's a year. That's how much power we're consuming. So when we're playing this game, we need to be keeping this in perspective. Now, loving the automobile, the first thing I began worrying about was, what are we going to do with our liquid fuel supply? Because that's going to run out at some point. Right now, it doesn't feel that way, but I promise you it will. Here's the numbers that I discovered. In the United States every year, 6.95 billion barrels of oil are used here, 70% of which are in transportation. To give you some sort of feeling on what that number looks like, uh, the map that you see here is basically where the Mississippi River drains the United States. The amount of oil that we use uh, flows through the mouth of the Mississippi River every single day. So we have a clear dependence on a large volume of a liquid. Now, right now, there are some interesting technologies that are in place to potentially uh, give us a new liquid source of fuel. We have biofuels, as an example. We're not going to consider the stuff that's not in full production yet. So miscanthus and switchgrass, we're going to leave to the side. We're also not going to consider algae, but I will say this. Uh, biofuels derived from algae, I read a study just this last year that suggests if we could make an algae pond the size of Maryland, we would be able to extract enough biofuels to uh, to completely replace our current uh, liquid fuel supply. But right now, that pond doesn't exist. So let's go to something we do have. You living in central Illinois, I'm sure, are very well, well aware of the fact that we have quite a bit of corn and soybeans. If you were to take all of the soybean acres and all of the corn acres, there's 90 million acres of corn being planted, uh, there's 78 million acres of, of beans being planted, and you were to use them to make biodiesel and ethanol, could we make enough from these sources? After doing a very little bit of mathematics, this is what we arrived at. We could, supply, uh, we could replace uh, about 17%. So when I was learning about this, my dreams of owning a Ferrari kind of started to float away. I had to readjust my car passion to something a little different because I don't think that our liquid fuel supply is going to be able to be matched the way it is today. So I think my next car is going to be one of these. I'm saving right now to get one. That's a Tesla, it runs on electricity. So if we're going to have to move away from a liquid fuel source and move over to something that maybe uh, is going to be used primarily in the electricity part of the world here, I wanted to figure out where we're going to get that electricity. Being an atmospheric scientist, I'm very well aware of what the wind can do. Since we have been on this planet, we've been using wind power. We use it to fill sails. We use it to spin windmills that will draw up water or grind grain. And now we're using it to generate electricity. The animation that you're seeing here is from April 9th, uh, 2015. You see that large swirl that's in northern Illinois near Lake Michigan? That was the big low pressure system that helped spawn the large tornadoes that were in northern Illinois just a week ago. Can we extract enough power from the wind to make up for the power that we're going to need when we run out of fossil fuels? That was the question I asked. Well, we have wind turbines, and we have a very windy United States, a very large and very windy United States. I know some of you like to process things with mathematics more than you like to hear words, so I decided to put some of this stuff on the screen. Let's make some realistic assumptions. You can see them there at the bottom. I wanted to know if we properly spaced our wind turbines and covered 10% of the United States with them, 
how much energy could we possibly get? Well, there's the energy density, 3.21 watts per meter squared. Cover 10% with wind turbines. The number's pretty amazing. Turns out that the potential energy that can be extracted from wind could match 87% of our current energy demand across all sectors. Kind of need to think about this. Of course, there are challenges. In fact, because this is one of the most developed technologies, we often hear a lot about the problems. I would like to just talk about one of them right now. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Impacts on wildlife and are they loud? So here we go. Uh, impacts on wildlife. A study in Denmark suggested that wind turbines every year kill 30,000 birds. 30,000 birds. The same study showed that automobiles in Denmark killed a million. They then expanded this study to uh, show what ho uh, goes on in the, in the UK, and that number shows that cats kill 55 million. <laughs> now, I am not saying, when I'm giving you these, these statistics, that wind turbines don't have an impact on wildlife. I'm just asking for some perspective. By the way, something neat to think about here, if you wanted to scale up wind energy, if you wanted to scale it up to make that kind of power, we'd have to move to a, a much larger number of turbines. Currently in the United States, we operate 60,000 wind turbines, about 60,000. The number you would need to make that 87% is 3.6 million. But right now the government is, su is supporting this. Another complaint I often hear about wind turbines is that they're very loud. Check out this graphic from GE. In this graphic, what you can see here is that the further away you get from the turbine, the quieter they become. They don't put wind turbines within 400 meters of any residence. And just so that you know, at that distance, you have an average uh, sound level around 40 decibels. While waiting for my talk, I measured the sound in this room. And it turns out that when nobody is speaking in here, the sound level is about 40 decibels. So that's the kind of sound we're talking about. Some neat things. Honestly, when I think about all of this, the thing that keeps coming back in my mind, though, is this. What we've got here is a video of our son. I've been talking for about 12 minutes. In those 12 minutes, that sun has provided the daylight side of the Earth with three months worth of energy that the entire world consumes. In fact, all of the energy that we're using in the coal, the oil, and the natural gas, and all the other sources is just old sun energy. In fact, all of you sitting in this room are old sun energy. And everything that is you came through your mouth to make you. And where did that come from? The sun. What I'm proposing is that we get better at using the fresh sun energy. It's pretty amazing. By the end of this, this long day, that sun will have supplied this planet with over 30 years worth of energy that not just the United States consumes, but the rest of the planet. And I think that properly using this energy is a wise decision. So as we're thinking about all of this, I want to give you kind of one last statistic. It's kind of a fun one. This is a map that shows you solar power. This is kilowatt hours per square meter per day. And let's look over there at Arizona. I wanted to know if we could collect energy from the sun and use it to power this planet. How much of this planet would we have to cover with, the, with solar panels? So we did the math. Those of you like to use the math, you can do the math very quickly right there. The number that I arrived at was staggering. Turns out that if you were able to, to collect with 100% efficiency, solar energy in the United States, you'd only have to cover about 3.8% of Arizona to get enough for the whole country. So I made a thing, we can't do anything unrealistic. That doesn't sound that unrealistic to me. It's a neat number to think about. So through my journey of trying to understand renewable alternative energy, it eventually led to uh, a real wind turbine being built. I want to show you what that looks like. Uh, so check this out. Here is a, a video of my wind turbine. It's on top of a building nearby. It's kind of fun. When you watch the video, the camera can't actually keep up with how fast the blades are spinning. So you'll see the blades appear like they've slowed down and bent. It's kind of a neat effect when you shoot a, a wind turbine with your, uh, with your uh, cell phone. But what's neat about this <laughs> is that the summer of 2010, when I decided to not buy a new car, I was able to do a lot of cool things I never thought I'd be able to do. And that one decision actually is going to lead me this coming winter to Haiti. I was asked by a professor there to come down and teach a two-week-long class 
on issues around renewable alternative energy. And as a part of that class, we will be building a small solar panel array to help the school that I will be teaching at maintain power throughout the day. You see, the original picture I showed you of, the, of our planet, when the lights that are all lit up, you can see it again right here. Um, you don't realize, but about a billion people on this planet do not have access to regular electricity. And this university is an example of that. Our goal is to go down there and to build a solar panel array and maybe even bring along a wind turbine so that they can have electricity to power their lights and keep the refrigerators running 24 hours a day. So while this image shows you where all the lights are on the planet, I would ask that maybe next year you watch a little closer to see if that little spot right there gets a little bit brighter. Thank you.